This is one of the worst things to admit about my Disney World vacations. Usually, the worst things that happen are my own fault. But let's make sure that's not going to be the case for you by exposing our own regrets. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog and the team and I have got some confessions to make. There are things we've done in Disney World that were major mistakes. Huge. But we're going to make sure we never do those things again and we're going to make sure today that you never have to experience them, period. That is what we do around here. We make the mistakes so you don't have to. So here's a bonus tip before we even get started. We never want to go to Disney World without having a game plan, which is why we've created those free Disney World planning worksheets that you can download right now to start organizing your reservations. Oh, and your must-dos and your packing list before it's time for your big vacation. You can get these worksheets by scanning that QR code you see on the screen or by heading to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney plans. So the first thing we are never going to do again in Disney World, well, honestly, we probably will, but we're going to warn you about it anyway, is stand in a pointless line. It is really easy to just kind of follow what everybody else is doing. And I'm not saying that to make fun of people in the Disney parks. We've all been there and have followed the road most traveled by, assuming it was the right answer, and ended up standing in pointless lines. But I do want to point out how following the majority of the crowd can lead you to waiting for things in Disney World way longer than you need to be waiting. Take the park entrances, for example. Each of Disney's parks has several entry points where you scan into the parks, but many times the majority of those rope-dropping crowds will congregate toward the middle entrances just because those are the entry points they see first. More often than not, if you break away from those center crowds and head to an entry point that's more toward the left or the far right-hand side of things, you should find those lines to be shorter. Just don't go too far over and wind up in the annual pass holder line if you're not a pass holder because those AP entry points are on the very far left and very far right-hand side of things. Now, waiting for rides can also get you into trouble. There are a handful of rides throughout each of the parks that we label as B-tier rides. Not because they're bad, but because they're typically less popular and don't usually rack up the weights quite like the A-tier rides will. Or if you're using old school Disney ticket terminology, the B-tier rides would be higher level than the A-tier rides. Anyway, that's another, that's another video altogether. We'll talk about that another time. However, during Disney's peak season times, or even just during Disney's normal times around early to mid afternoon, even those second tier rides can get pretty lengthy when it comes to their lines. For example, during one of our team members' last trips to Animal Kingdom, her friends and she noticed that the wait time for Dinosaur was pushing 50-minute waits once the clock struck noon. This is not normal for Dinosaur. Typically, this ride's going to average about a 20 to 30-minute wait. So they knew they needed to do something else and bide their time while the afternoon crowds dwindled down. After a couple of hours, the wait was back to 25 minutes and they jumped in line for it. The thing is, Many folks who are new to the Disney scene aren't going to know which rides are considered as super popular or not super popular. So they may look at the high wait times for a lower level ride and assume that's about average. That's why it's so important to download the My Disney Experience app ahead of your trip and start studying up on the average wait times for your must-do rides. That way you're going to know better than to wait over half an hour for a ride that's normally much, much less busy. Another example of how this can happen is over at Spaceship Earth and Epcot, right? Everybody enters through that front entrance and the first ride they see is Spaceship Earth. So at the beginning of the day, you're going to see a huge glut of people just head over to Spaceship Earth. Like that's the only ride in the park. And so you'll get that really long line early in the day, but then people will scatter throughout the rest of the park and midday toward the end of the day, you're not going to see as long a line at Spaceship Earth. So don't ride Spaceship Earth first. It's going to be a much shorter line later. I also recommend checking out our Disney World ride ranking videos for each of the parks on our YouTube channel. That's where we not only tell you the pros and cons for the rides, but we also fill you in on how long you can typically expect to wait in line for them too. Okay, how about one last useless line that you stand in before we move on? Some of you longtime DFB viewers may already know that I'm about to throw this under the bus. Starbucks. Look, I get it. Some of y'all need that Starbucks fix at the start of your day, but the Disney parks locations that sell Starbucks drinks and pastries are going to be just silly busy at the start of the day. If you're simply looking for coffee to get your energy flowing, find out which of the park's quick service locations will also serve you coffee. You can track these quick services down by opening up your My Disney Experience app, typing the word coffee in the search engine, and seeing what pops up for you. While these quick services may not have as many options for you as the Starbucks locations will, you'll more than likely be able to mobile order your coffee from them instead of waiting in a forever long physical queue, which you'll have to do if you're Starbies or bust. 
Time is money, my friends, so use your time wisely and don't always follow the crowd because they're not always going to be right. All right, be careful of compartmentalizing. I've heard it time and time again. There are people who compartmentalize the whole Disney experience into kid stuff and adult stuff, but that's all a bunch of hooey. Yeah, there are some super specific things that are going to be labeled for certain age groups only, like how Disney's really high-end restaurants like Victoria and Albert's at the Grand Floridian Resort and Spa is only going to be for guests 10 years and up, while the full-on Magic Kingdom makeover service Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique is only for guests 3 to 12. But for the most part, Disney World is a vacation built for the whole family, and that means it's for the kids and the kids at heart. So if you're an adult visiting the Disney parks, don't let anyone make you feel silly for singing along with the shows or dancing along with the parade floats or even meeting some of your longtime favorite Disney characters, because that's still exciting stuff no matter how old you are. Not to mention, you paid for this vacation, so you deserve to get just as excited about these attractions and characters and offerings as the kids do. Simply put, allow yourself to be a kid again and only compartmentalize what has to be compartmentalized due to Disney's rules. Seriously, life is stressful enough, so give yourself permission to cry over the fireworks or buy a sweet treat from one of the confectionery shops and wear the Mickey ears. All right, so don't worry about taking someone older to the parks. When I say Disney World is a place for all ages, I mean it. It can be a place for all ages, including grandparents and other older family members, too. I went to Disney World with my 81-year-old mom this summer, and we had an absolute blast. My dad had always told me that he wanted to take my mom back to Disney just one more time, but he passed away in 2021 before he could. So we made it happen for him. While my mom can still walk, it gets hard for her to keep up after a while, so I bought a transport wheelchair, which is the kind with the little wheels that fold up relatively small, for her to use while we were moseying around the parks. I called it her old lady stroller because that's kind of the relationship I have with my mom, so I apologize if anybody gets offended by that. And you know what? It was super worth it. She got to ride almost everything, and sure, I had to push that wheelchair up those giant Animal Kingdom ramps leading up to Flight of Passage, but oh my gosh, I would do it again in a heartbeat. She still hasn't stopped talking about that ride, which I don't blame her for that ride is seriously the coolest and now it's one of my all-time favorites since I got to make that memory with her. We also stayed at Disney's Wilderness Lodge during her trip because that is her favorite resort. We spent a lot of time there just taking in the scenic views and enjoying the restaurants and just simply hanging out together. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is don't be afraid to take someone older to the parks because you're afraid it'll be too much for them. Rent an ECV or a wheelchair either from the parks themselves or from a reliable third-party service in the area. Take things a little more slowly, work in those pool days and rest days, and just enjoy that time that you have together. You won't regret it. I definitely don't. All right, so don't get caught in a bathroom emergency. Believe me, this is not a fun time, y'all. If you are in dire need of a bathroom during your park day, then you're going to want to know where the nearest potty is ASAP. The My Disney Experience app can be your savior in these trying times. When you open the app, head over to the park map and tap on the little arrow next to the wait times header. There, you're going to find other specific categories for you to track down aside from just the rides, including Eureka! bathrooms. Or if the toilet emergency is red alert and you can't even find it in you to open the app, you can always ask a nearby cast member to point you in the right direction. They're going to be happy to help you out as well. Oh, and by the by, I think we actually have videos on here (laughs) with all of the best bathrooms in Walt Disney World, like have entire exclusive videos about them. So definitely check that out too. All right, don't forget to boost that immune system. Pixie dust and germs are everywhere in Disney World. That's why we call it a Petri dish. So it's best you prepare your immune system to keep from bringing home something that's not a souvenir or a hitchhiking ghost. Tablets and drinks loaded with lots of vitamin C, like emergency, can help boost your immune system before and during your trip. And don't go anywhere without a portable bottle of hand sanitizer or those sanitizing wipes to use when eating your meals and after getting off attractions. But perhaps one of the best things you can do for your and your group to help you be healthy and stay that way is to not ignore what your body is demanding from you. You're bound to go hard on a Disney trip, which might mean going to bed later and waking up earlier than you're used to. And while it's understandable to want to see and do as much as you can because you paid a bunch of money for this, you're still going to want to factor in hopefully eight hours of sleep per night to prevent shooting your immune system in the foot. And if you can't get that eight hours, I understand sometimes you got to do fireworks and then you got to do rope drop the next morning. Give yourself a rest day somewhere in there just so that you can use it if you need it. 
And I'm never going to ditch the schedule again in Disney World. I say this every time, and I do it every time. So alas, I am a horrible role model. Anyway, Disney World is a place where your everyday schedule can and will get thrown out the window. We're talking later dining times, 10,000 plus extra steps than you're used to taking each day. Sometimes I'll be honest, like 20,000 extra steps than you're used to taking each day. Super early mornings. And while you may not want to revert to your everyday schedule while you're on a Disney vacation line, some Sometimes it's absolutely necessary to do so at least somewhat. If your kids have regularly scheduled afternoon naps, for instance, you probably don't want to skip that just to squeeze in some extra rides and meet and greets during the day. Your kids might wind up pretty cranky and whiny later on, which will inadvertently leave you cranky and whiny later on too. And while backtracking to your hotel room to take that one to two hour nap is probably ideal, it's not always the most practical solution, especially if your hotel is farther away. So some kids are going to be content with sleeping for a couple hours in their comfy little stroller, just as long as they have some sort of umbrella cover to keep the sun out of their eyes. But if your kid tends to need somewhere a little more peaceful to snooze, track down one of the baby care centers. Each park has one and they offer a quiet, peaceful, and private spot for parents to get in a quick diaper change, nurse, or pick up any baby necessities they might have forgotten to pack or ran out of at the parks. It's also a decent spot for a nice little power nap before returning full force into your fun-filled day. And on a completely different note, but still on the same stick with your schedule subject, don't forget to take your meds on time too. Like I said, Disney World has quite a way with skewing schedules. You might wake up super early to rope drop and forget to take your morning meds, or you might wind up staying super late at a park and just barely making it over the threshold of your hotel room door before you pass out, missing your evening doses. It happens more often than you realize, so set alarms on your phone to remind yourself to stay on top of things and take your meds. Oh, And here's a bonus tip for you. Don't forget to bring allergy meds with you if you're planning on going to Disney World in the spring. While you might not be allergic to anything back at home, Epcot hosts their annual Flower and Garden Festival during the spring season, bringing with it hundreds of different flowers and plants that look pretty, but might also trigger some sort of allergy that you weren't expecting. It happens to me, and I end up having to take allergy meds at the beginning of that festival. So let's keep the runny noses and itchy throats where they belong, far away from your vacation. Now, we talk about this one over and over and over and over again, and yet people still fall victim to having to wear painful shoes in Disney World every single day, including us. Yes, we do it. So even if you know better and you pack a pair of shoes you consider worn and reliable, there are still lots of reasons to bring a backup pair, just in case. I mean, anything could happen, right? The rain could soak your shoes on day one, one of your sandal straps could break, the back of your shoe could suddenly start rubbing against your heel the wrong way, and you got a blister. And if you've only packed that one pair, pair of shoes for your whole trip, you might end up having to splurge on a pricey pair from one of the Disney gift shops so you can survive the rest of the parks. I'm guilty. So learn from us. Bring one or two other pairs of shoes just in case they have to tag in while your other shoes get benched for the rest of the game. I recommend bringing at least one pair of tennis shoes and one pair of park-worthy sandals like quick-drying Tevas or Chacos or something. This not only gives your feet a little more variety, but sandals tend to be better to wear around the parks during soggy, rainy days so you don't have to worry about soaking your sneakers right off the bat. Ah, yes, don't miss out on exclusive snacks. Disney has its reliable snack staples you can always fall back on, the Mickey pretzels, the premium ice cream bars, the Dole Whips, but some Disney snacks are only around for a limited time, and if you're not looking out for them, then you might miss them. That's why we keep our DFB fam in the loop whenever we learn about new snacky surprises, because if there's something sweet or salty or spicy or even sour that we think y'all would be on the lookout for during your upcoming Disney visit, we're going to let you know about it. That's why you follow us. That's why you're here. So if you want to be one of the first to know about all the latest Disney snack news, as well as other important Disney info too, I'm going to link our DFB newsletter info down in the description for you. We eat everything. Yep everything that comes out in Disney World. Now remember, there's literally no strings attached here. If you want to unsubscribe from the newsletter, you totally can. We just want you to be well informed before your visit so you're not left in the dark while you're there about anything. Ooh, yes, I will never again avoid the overpriced essentials just out of sheer pride. Sure, if at all possible, it's always better to plan ahead and pack all of your necessities ahead of time. Or you can order from a grocery delivery service to have necessities brought straight to your hotel if you forget anything crucial. That way, you can avoid having to pay more for those same basic essentials while you're inside the Disney bubble. But if you're in desperate need for something while you're in the parks or at your resort, right then and there, 
don't just tough it out to avoid overpaying. If your Disney date is a washout and you're in desperate need of a poncho, Disney's got them. If the weather drops down way lower than you were expecting it to and you're walking around in short sleeves, Disney's got jackets and hoodies. I can highly recommend buying a scarf. For some reason, it makes me warmer than everything else. If you're at your resort and your baby has a diaper mishap, yet you accidentally didn't pack enough diapers and you're thinking, what am I going to do? The resort gift shop will have a package of emergency diapers for you to purchase. You get the picture. While it's not ideal to spend more money than you want to on certain items that you can get for cheaper someplace else, don't forget that time is money too. And taking time out of your vacation to track down cheaper stuff just to avoid Disney's upcharges might end up being a waste of time for you, especially when you're in need of something immediately. That's why it's always important to save a little safety net money in your budget, like maybe an extra hundred bucks or two hundred bucks more than you think you're going to need. Best case scenario, you don't need any of the safety net money whatsoever and you can use it towards a souvenir at the end. I will never just get off the bus at the first stop without knowing where I am. Okay, I'm telling you this now, but I guarantee you that I'm still going to slip up and do this exact thing in the future. Just you wait. So many resorts use those internal bus loops, which means you may have to stop at a few different bus stations before leaving to go to the parks, or you may have to make a few extra stops at the end of the night before you reach the stop that's closest to your room. Now, there have been times in the past where some of our DFB team members, me included, have had a really long day in the parks, finally get on a bus to go back to their hotel, and then just jump off at the first stop that their bus comes to simply because they're tired and eager to get back to their room. But this is a potentially fatal mistake. You know what I mean. Those resorts that use internal bus loops like Coronado Springs, Caribbean Beach, Animal Kingdom Lodge, they're so spread out. So if you get off at the wrong bus stop, you might find yourself walking for another half hour just to make it back to your room at the end of the night. I was recently on a bus trying to get back to the Swan and Dolphin Resorts. And at that particular time, that bus was also going to Swan and Dolphin, Yacht Club, Beach Club, and Boardwalk. Now, if you know that area of the Disney hotel scene, you know that those are pretty far away from each other. Like, yeah, they're walkable. They're 15, 20 minutes away maybe. But when you're parking at the bus stop, getting off, you have to go through the whole hotel. Then you have to walk through the boardwalk. It just, it's a long, long walk that late at night. Now, deluxe resorts can sometimes do that to you. Usually the internal bus stops are going to be at the big spread out moderate resorts. But sometimes deluxe resorts will do that to you too. Just a heads up. So definitely don't make any assumptions about where you're going next and check with the driver to make sure you're getting off at your correct bus stop. Also, take a picture of the bus stop you're using at the start of the day so you remember which one you need to wait for. It's also important to remember which building your room is located in since your bus driver will let you know where the bus is dropping you off next. Oh yes, don't assume that Epcot Festival timelines are always the same. In a lot of ways, the Epcot Festivals are pretty predictable. There are four different festivals offered throughout the year, with each one having its own food booths, entertainment, and exclusive merchandise. But don't get caught up in the repetition so much that you just assume that all Epcot Festivals remain stagnant, because they will switch up on you and throw off your groove, especially this year. For starters, food booths and food offerings can change with each passing year, which means we get to try a lot of new stuff but we also have to mourn what stuff's gone missing. R.I.P. Flower and Garden Artisan Cotton Candy, R.I.P. Musical groups, artists, celebrity narrators for the candlelight processionals, they can also switch up with each new fest, so you're going to want to stay up to date on who will be making their appearance at Epcot and when they'll be taking the main stage. And let's not forget about the addition of the Communicore Hall and Plaza over in the World Celebration area, which is getting ready to add a whole other layer of offerings for each Epcot festival. Communicore Hall is going to be an indoor space with areas for interactive exhibits, new festival offerings, character meet and greets, live demos, and more. Well, Communicore Plaza will be the outdoor space right next to the hall that's going to host even more festival booths and outdoor entertainment. Now, one of the biggest ways the Epcot festivals can pull a fast one on you is when they change up when they're taking place. We can typically rely on which season each festival will happen. We got Festival of the Arts in the early winter, Flower and Garden throughout the spring, Food and Wine is midsummer, lasts throughout midfall, and Festival of the Holidays wraps up the year. 
For the past few years, both Flower and Garden and Food and Wine have been the two longest lasting festivals of the park. But we recently learned that Flower and Garden this year is actually going to be a whole lot shorter than it has been. In 2024, Flower and Garden will begin earlier than it usually does starting on February 28th, but then it'll end on May 27th, making it 36 days shorter than it was in 2023. If the Epcot Food and Wine Festival doesn't start shortly after that, which we have yet to learn from Disney, then this could mean you'll be missing out on a festival if you're visiting between the two. Or maybe Disney's going to add a new festival? I don't know. So while that might be disappointing for some, others really don't mind missing out on festival season since it can provide you with fewer Epcot crowds, making it much easier to navigate between the rides and World Showcase pavilions without all the extra festival food booth congestion. So it really just depends on what you're after, to festival or not to festival. We'll make sure to let you know when the Food and Wine Festival is happening once we hear more about it. But in the meantime, if you want to plan your Epcot visit during Flower and Garden, just remember it's not going to be here nearly as long as it usually is, so you may have to plan your trip earlier than you thought you'd need to. Oh, this is a gross one, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Don't let all your stuff get disgusting. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Reusable items are great until they are not. I'm talking about reusable straws, baby bottles, cooling towels, all those reusable items that can be absolutely essential for your upcoming visit. However, if you don't take care of these, they can get gross. Straws can start to get gunky, baby bottles can start having that sour milk smell, and cooling towels can start to get all mildewy while also stinking like sweat. And that's not because y'all are unclean, but when you use something and then shove it immediately back into your park bag, thinking it'll be fine to just clean out later on, and then you forget when you get home, then that reusable item just sits in your bag for hours on end while you walk around in the 90 plus degree weather. Next thing you know, you unzip your bag and a wretched smell comes wafting out of it. Make sure that before you put away those reusable items, they're clean. I know that takes some time out of your day, but it doesn't take too terribly much, especially if you've got the right tools handy. Reusable straws come with those little cleaning brushes that make scrubbing them so much easier, and getting a cleaning brush for your bottle might be worth investing in too. I used to actually travel when my son was really, really small. I would bring a little bottle of dish detergent and a bottle brush so I could make sure to wash those out every night real well. Oh, you might also be able to find a little collapsible sink that you can put into your hotel sink to kind of serve as your washing area. Now, as for cooling towels, not a bad idea to bring some sort of bag clippy so you can just easily attach the towel to the outside of your bag instead of stuffing it down in your bag. Or you can bring along a Ziploc bag to keep that potential smell locked up tight for now. Hey everyone, it's Bria, and in case you don't know who I am, I'm basically AJ's cohort in crime, aka the scriptwriter of this channel, and she's letting me pop in today because I wanted to tell you about something I'm never gonna do in Disney again, and that is stress over my dog. Okay, that's probably a lie. I know I'm going to stress over my dog again, but I'm going to try not to. But before I get into this point, I want to introduce you to my little Chihuahua, Kyrie. I know, she's cute. And yes, she is named after a Kingdom Hearts character for all you other video game nerds out there. Kyrie is what you'd call a Velcro dog. We love her and we love all her clingy ways. But when we're planning a trip out to Disney, she does cause us an extra layer of stress because we have to find someone who can walk her and take her out to potty and feed her and come her down when she's afraid we've abandoned her for good, which yes, does rack me and my husband with plenty of guilt even in the midst of our happy-go-lucky Disney days. Because Kyrie gets really anxious and has a lot of separation anxiety, we like to have people she's familiar with come over to our house to watch her so she doesn't have to suddenly be uprooted and dropped into a new environment. But we can't always assume our friends are just going to be able to drop everything and watch her for us because they've got lives too. So dog sitting apps like Rover and Trusted House Sitters have been great resources resources for us. These apps are like the Tinder of dog sitters. You can scroll through all the different sitters available in your area, check out the ratings and reviews, and learn about the rates and services that they can offer to your little friend. And if you can't stand the idea of traveling without your beloved pooch, select Disney resorts do have dog-friendly accommodations available, like over at Art of Animation, Port Orleans Riverside, Yacht Club, and the cabins at Fort Wilderness. And don't worry about these resorts if you're someone who struggles with pet allergies. These dog-friendly accommodations are only in certain sections of the resort so the remainder of the rooms are still canine free. You might also want to look into Airbnbs or Verbos with pet friendly accommodations since those might actually give your doggo some more room and backyard space to run around while 
figure out at the parks. It's also good to know that Disney has their own pet boarding services on property over at the Best Friends Pet Hotel. Here, your little companion can still join you on your Disney vacation, but they don't have to stay all cooped up in a small, unfamiliar room all day with no one there to entertain them. The Best Friends Hotel offers overnight boarding and daycare services with different priced packages for you to choose from to help best fit your budget. And all those pet accommodations do indeed go the extra mile, with most room types including a patio, webcam, walks, playtime, and even direct messaging. And if you want to get really bougie with it, the more luxurious pet rooms come with a flat screen TV. So yeah, your doggo ain't going to be suffering here by any means. If you're a fellow Velcro dog owner, I sympathize with you. But there are some ways to help alleviate alleviate that stress while you're away for both you and your four-legged friend. All right, back to AJ. There, now you don't have to worry about slipping into these Disney World traps during your next vacation. Don't forget, we've got those free Disney World planning worksheets just waiting to send your way. So go ahead and drop us your email at disneyfoodblog.com slash Disney plans, and we'll give them to you faster than you can say, please stand clear of the doors. If you know, you know. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.